nobody around, just a vehicle sitting there, quietly steaming, vapors coming off. There's a guy to take you up in the elevator and a couple of fellows to put you in the uh, vehicle and close the hatch. The voice communications become quite silent in the last minutes. You do hear the counting down to uh, T equals zero. Seconds before that, though, you feel the ship move and the main engines come on. And you can feel the rumble. It, that seems a long, long way away, but you know it's just about, a, I guess, 100 feet below you. Of course, that's, I guess, about one and a quarter million pounds of thrust when they light those three engines off. And, of course, it shakes the orbiter, so the thing bends. You feel the orbiter flex one way and then back the other way. And as the rock relaxes and comes back, then there's a sound that is the sound of an explosion. And you get that kick in the pants when the solid's light, and you're up, up, and away in a big hurry. I guess I wasn't quite expecting the jolt that we got. Uh, we're going something over about 100 miles an hour by the time we reach the top of the tower, so it really is jumping right off the launch pad. It's like a continuing train wreck in sound. It is just an overwhelming, bone-crushing, rattling and shaking. And then immediately you hit that roll maneuver. And that's also the time that we start to enter what we call load relief, which is where we steer, we'll steer the whole vehicle into the wind to minimize the wind loads on the orbiter. So it's a very dynamic, a very shaky, buffeting, vibrating time frame. All space rookies, and I'll speak for myself, are, are slightly just hanging on during the first couple of minutes anyway. You're just sitting there hoping like heck that nothing happens to any of the engines because your mind's clicking and thinking all the time, all right, what do I need to look for? What do I need to, what do I need to be ready to do? If an engine fails right now or if another system fails right now, what do I have to do to make sure that we can, one, hopefully continue on to orbit, two, get down safely if we can. This strange, loud, roaring staccato is somehow punctuated by another sound of an explosion. And that's the solid rock that's being released. Just as they're jettisoned, there's a tremendous flash because we've got these smaller batch of rocket motors that pushes the solid rocket motors away from you. And it looks like you're flying through a fireball when those things go off. And that's, that's a real thrill to see that for the first time. After that point, it's very smooth, almost like you have electric motors. Now the acceleration really comes up. Now the three Gs when you're at that point, you feel like you could not pull your head off the seat to lean forward. Uh, but it's, it's a real push. It almost hurts to breathe. Your chest is being compressed and you have to work to expand your chest and take in air against the acceleration. Very suddenly as you come up to 25,000 feet per second, there is another sound as the computers shut off the main engines and a lurch as the external tank is, is blown away. And you feel yourself thrown forward in the shoulder straps. And what you're feeling is the fact that you really weigh nothing at all. And you know you're, that you've arrived in orbit. The whole experience is just a tremendous adventure. And it's the kind of thing that right when you get to main engine cutoff on my first flight, I remember I, I smiled from ear to ear right when the engines went off and said, what, a, what an experience. Let's go back and do that again. I really enjoyed it. The space shuttle became a symbol of America. It represented the best of American ingenuity and bravado. We knew how to get to space safely and back, but we had built the most complicated piece of machinery in the world Hundreds of critical functions had to work perfectly every time.
ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and Mrs. Reagan, and astronauts Mattingly and Hartsfield. The fourth landing of the Columbia is the historical equivalent to the driving of the Golden Spike, which completed the first transcontinental railroad. It marks our entrance into a new era. The test flights are over. The groundwork has been laid. Beginning with the next flight, the Columbia and her sister ships will be fully operational. We sold it as being an operational vehicle. We declared that it was operational because we were done with our four flight test program. But I think the word operational, I think most of the astronauts probably smiled a little bit when we said we're operational. I was at Hoot Gibson's last launch just three weeks before the Challenger accident. Writing about that next to last mission, like so many of the press and public, I grew impatient as scrub followed scrub, once at T minus 14 seconds, once for a stuck hatch. With hindsight, that litany of difficulties was a warning. This 24th mission would become the most delayed mission of the shuttle era. As it attempted to get off the ground, Challenger hovered in the background, waiting its final fateful turn. On one of five attempts to launch Columbia, 18,000 pounds of liquid oxygen fuel had been mistakenly siphoned from the fuel tank. Had there been a launch that day, the shuttle would have aborted its mission within minutes of liftoff. This is what would have happened. High in the stratosphere with the fuel tank still attached, Hoot Gibson would have reversed direction. He would then have attempted an emergency landing back at Cape Canaveral. That's what the computer simulator said could be done. In fact, this maneuver has never been flown by any powered flying machine. The weather was another threat to the crew. It was cold. On this chilly December morning, it was 41 degrees. We know now, but shuttle crews never knew, that cold temperatures cause O-rings to fail, and this caused the Challenger crash. It took us five times to get off the ground. We went through more aborts than anyone thought was ever possible. We'd have to say someone was watching over us because in, in several of those instances, it could have been very serious if we had actually launched that day. <laughs> Clowning masked the tension. But what were they really thinking as they marked the clapperboard, Hoot rides again, take five. We had an indication that we had a, a very big helium leak in one of our tanks that supports one of the main engines. So it was an apparent serious malfunction. Helium is used in one of the turbo pumps and it's used to purge a cavity that's between the hydrogen and the oxygen. If you lose that purge, you're gonna blend those two together. And it can explode. And that, it will explode. That's very definitely an explosion potential. We say that we're operational, but I keep looking back to a vehicle that we flew for years called the X-15. We made over 200 missions with the X-15. We never called that thing anything but an experimental rocket plane. In the era of routine spaceflight, the right stuff of the 1950s and 60s seemed like a thing of the past. And now we have an orbiter, a space shuttle orbiter, that's about 50 times as complex as the X-15 was, but it was operational after four flights. And I think it just says, Jim, that we are operating a machine that by its very nature is going to be somewhat of an experimental device, somewhat of a uh, research and development vehicle, 
and it's not going to be operational until we've got 200 or 300 flights on the thing. In 1963, NASA began uncertain experiments with so-called lifting bodies that could fly in space, glide to Earth, and land on an airstrip. Different designs were tested at Edwards Air Force Base with mixed results. Here, Maxime Faget, the legendary designer of the Mercury capsule, holds his early design for the space shuttle. The designs went through many incarnations. The engineers wanted a Cadillac. They got a Chevy. It would be reliable, but sometimes short on options. Risks were built in. The vehicle was a glider. Once it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, it had one chance only to land somewhere. It needed tremendous boost to get its bulk into orbit, but the boosters propelled by the more efficient solid fuel could not be turned off once they were lit. And if they were flawed, they could not be jettisoned. Astronauts considered the solids fail-safe until the Challenger disaster. The only way that the, the crew on 51L had uh, of getting it solid was to wait for them to burn out. It is an image burnt in our collective consciousness. We had accepted it as flawless, but it was designed by a bureaucracy and built by humans. After the accident, there was an effort to apportion blame. But in the end, we were thrown back on technical explanations. You gotta remember that the thrusting solid rocket is really got a lot of thrust. So the minute you let that go, you're separating highly stressed structure, which in itself could be destruct destructive. If you're not exactly the right angle attack, it can tear the orbiter up. That's essentially what happened on 51L when it came, on, came apart uh, from the stack, and then, of course, they had a pressure wave pushing against it, too. It, it was aerodynamically broken up. And the other thing is that you, you got a wild solid rocket the minute you separate it, because it's getting all its steering signals from an umbilical to the orbiter. The minute you cut that umbilical, it could steer itself right into the tank or into the wing or anything. After the Challenger accident, I returned to the Johnson Space Center to find a very different place. Before the accident, I had been swept up by the giddy vitality of Johnson Space Center. Now I wondered what the recovery process would be like and what its effect would be on those who had placed such ultimate faith in the system. I knew the reconstruction would be painful. I wanted to know how fundamental would be the overhaul. Prodded by the Rogers Commission, meetings on every aspect of the shuttle system are taking place. Today's meeting was to probe the agonizing topic of emergency escape. The study was to include egress and escape, and we uh, set uh, some constraints for ourselves in that we considered from on the pad to orbit and then from orbit to landing. Now, we, we have not taken on orbital rescue. Engineers and managers reevaluated the risks they had accepted and balanced them against the gains they had sometimes overestimated. And we think that's what those aft attacks were. Here they reconsidered yet again whether it had been a mistake to have no escape system for the shuttle crew. We decided to take on existing... It is not an easy question. In the enterprise of space, there is no such a thing as perfect safety. To add complicated explosive ejection systems for crew escape can actually increase risk rather than diminish it. I'd like to remind everybody here, there are some failures, no matter what I did or what you asked us to do, 
we could not solve. There are some failures for which no escape system is going to help you. Even before the Challenger tragedy, crews trained in escape procedures, knowing full well that their real chances for escape in an emergency were confined to a few benign scenarios. The basic design of the shuttle was on a certain premise. And within that premise, uh, I think the design was right. We could have done a number of things that have been brought up since then. We could have put escape capsules in the shuttle. But that's been mentioned. In earlier programs, crew capsules could be blasted away. With the shuttle, Baskets, slide wires, and a ride in a speeding, armored personnel carrier provided a quaint system for escape from a conflagration or an explosion on the launch pad. Senior astronaut Henry Hartsfield has charge of a post-challenger committee on crew safety. In fact, it, it wouldn't do you much good to, to, to even if you got away from the initial fireball, to, uh, to get away and then land out there and have it all come down on you, you know. And pieces could be raining down. Uh, as you know, there's a heck of a lot of energy stored there. And if it really did explode, uh, it could send debris pretty, pretty long distance. If you have a big fire outside the vehicle, uh, such as we had for a while on 41D, that nobody realized was there, you might get very crispy heading for it. Uh, so you'd worry about that. The crowds that flocked to shuttle launches as a social event were three miles away from the pad for a very good reason. On a 1984 mission commanded by Hartsfield, the countdown proceeded normally until the main engines fired. Then, just before the point of no return, the main engine shut down. T minus four seconds was a terrifying moment. We immediately got a master alarm, which is a tone that goes off in the cockpit, which we hear in our headsets. There are several different kinds of tones we can hear. This one was almost the most severe tone you can hear, so we knew we had a, a very serious problem. There was some misunderstanding on the part of the launch control team of whether we still had an engine running or not. I thought it was about 10 or 12 minutes after the actual shutdown that somebody said they saw a fire. I know there's a small flame on uh, monitor 50A on, this, uh, on the main engine. And that's the first point that I perked up here. You know, fire, I don't like fire. So... On the main engine? I'd like to check that we'd have no fire detectors going off on the zero level. In my mind, the only thing we could do was get out of the bird if, in a heck of a hurry if there was something bad going on. Hydrogen burns without visible flame, and the only time that you really can see fire in that situation is when part of the orbiter begins to burn. So there was some fire coming up the side of the vehicle, we found out later, that could have been heating the area that we would have had to go out across to, to get out to the slide wires. And we wouldn't have known that was there because it was invisible and could have gotten burned. You people are famous for understating situations. It's more than just perking up, isn't it? Well, I, I think, you know, we said, well, he got our attention, let's put it that way. <laughs> the first four flights of the shuttle did have ejection seats. But successful ejection was only possible close to the ground, at a slow speed, and not available for the mid-deck passengers who were added later. There were some parts that we were very much concerned ejecting in first stage because uh, you would go through the plume of the solid rocket motor and of course that all the metallic particles particles in that uh, plume would probably eat you up eat the suit up and the chute or anything else you had the ejection seats provided uh, only escape for the the pilot and the commander two out of the six or seven crew members you may have uh, furthermore, they represent a great deal of weight. Uh, and finally, they represent a very small amount of safety. See, one of the problems we have with a bailout is that uh, we already have a blowout hatch on top. It's, uh, well, why don't you just go out the top? But you hit the vertical tail and those big ohms pots in the back. 
And if you blow the side hatch and go out, you hit the wing. Or if you make it over the top of the wing, then you hit the home spot. We flew in, in a few missions where we had the ejection seats still in there, where two people had ejection seats and two did not. And, and the, the ejection seats were disarmed. <laughs> it wouldn't it make you nervous to go on the airliner and the pilot and the co-pilot walk down the aisle with a parachute on, you know? <laughs> I think that would bother you. It would bother me. <laughs> I think everybody ought to have a chance to get out of the vehicle. If you're going to provide an escape means, then you need to provide it for everybody. With no effective means of escape, the safety of the crews depends upon the sharp response of the spacecraft pilots. Half of the 80-member corps is made up of pilot astronauts. NASA provides T-38 trainers to them to keep their flying edge. Had, I was uh, interested in what happened to a man like Rick Houck, whom I knew in high school. Commander Houck, Navy carrier pilot, Vietnam veteran, test pilot, has flown two missions, and he was scheduled to fly the Challenger on its next flight after 51L. What does a man do who's been trained to a fine edge and then suddenly must wait two years to fly again? In NASA's downtime, Commander Houck had to take a desk job in Washington. But he also worried about keeping his place in line to fly one of the early missions once shuttle flights begin again. So he returned to Houston regularly to train in the shuttle simulator. Booster. Engines. Three ready. Max. APUs. The simulator receives its crews in shifts, as if there were still a space flight every six weeks. It reproduces the cockpit of the shuttle exactly, as far away the system that encases the cockpit is re-examined item by critical item. Discovery, Houston contact. Can you call us Columbia? Discovery. Roger, loud and clear, House. Clear. Lift off. Right trim switch to inhibit, please. Lift off confirmed. Roll program. 3 at 104, LVLA. Roll. Those winds are bumping us around a little bit. Okay, Houston, IMU 2 and accelerometer number 2 are shot down. Mission control guides the simulation as if it were a real mission. What you hear in the headsets is a full dress rehearsal for potential catastrophes. We picked up a leak uh, in APU number 2. It's pretty big. Throttle up, 104. Capcom, go with throttle up. Discovery, you can go with throttle up. Roger, go with throttle up. Looks like the engine went down. Push the button. Left engine out, booster. Looks like the engine's down. They need to push the button. Check confirming cues, push the button. Item two. We got the board light. Turn, you copy aboard our killer. Of course, we don't expect to see failures in the first place, but some of our simulations are failures piled upon failures. And we just got a red light on the center engine. The lights are flashing. This electrical system's down, the hydraulic system's quit, the uh, computers of uh, one of them has quit. Houston, we just got a red light on the center engine, although everything else looks normal. But the important thing there is that just like everything else, you want to ensure that you have a, you've trained to a level much higher than you could ever expect to have to exercise in a real flight. Eugene Krantz is another fabled figure in NASA. He was a flight director for the moon landings and a pivotal person in the return of the crippled Apollo 13. Now he heads flight control operations. The training process is such that you really do not truly feel or experience emotion because you are expected to act, lead a team, and move on. The core of the training process is what we call our simulation supervisor. The sim supervises the mouths, malfunctions, and the nits, nitpicks, and piles them one upon another in split-second time. In their scripts, mouths and nits can very well disguise the major malfunction. They're a special breed with an odd sense of humor. <laughs> That's true. A sim soup generally uh, works a lot with uh, Murphy's Law. Anything that could go wrong will go wrong, and that's generally what we cause to happen. 
But I think there's a sadistic streak associated with these folks that they basically want to try to penetrate the individuals and they'll use any approach or method available to them to do that. They know and they can observe those people who are tired. They'll attack uh, the first woman that will put on the team to find out if uh, she can stand up to the pressures. Okay, Houston, we're working a uh, helium problem on the center engine. The simulation supervisor he will attack every facet of the human, whether it be his ego, his knowledge base, near to the point of destroying that individual to strengthen him and to develop the judgment that he needs to participate in a mission. Good, nose wheel steering. 130, I'm getting... GPC-2 just failed. That takes out nose wheel steering. Okay. Five feet per second square. Okay. No, it's not a game. You can sit around a table all day and debate something for hours, but in some situations, you have to make a decision now. Snap decisions come naturally to test pilots. Edwards Air Force Base, with its own private rituals, is their mecca. After the Challenger accident, Colonel Roy Bridges came back here to command a test wing. Thank you, Brian. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. We're going to patch that up. We got all of it, sir. I honestly have forgotten all of that. <laughs> like all shuttle pilots, he was a military test pilot before he went to NASA to ride the stack. It's a great machine. You guys have done well over the years. That thing is uh, real joyful. A little faster than ATN. It was on this training ground for the legendary Wright stuff that Bridges first learned to live on the edge of the envelope. He makes a science of keeping emotion out of the business. Ceremonial toast. Certainly. Certainly. The Eagle Drivers, past, present, and future. He talks coldly of risk assessment and hazard analysis. Most all the astronauts were once, once test pilots, so we all come from pretty much a common pool, and, and we tend to do similar things, whether we're here or whether we're at NASA. As test pilots, we try to find every way possible to cut down on the risk. And we try to have several options for all the unknowns. There is uh, quite a bit of similarity in how we approach a risky business. Roy Bridges would need all his professional cool when he piloted 51F, the 19th shuttle mission. The mission 51F read like one of the worst SimSoup scripts. The liftoff and the separation of the solids were normal. Five minutes into the flight, just after the routine call of press to ATO, one of the three orbiter main engines abruptly shut down. Stand by for press to ATO. Challenger, Houston, press, press to ATO. Roger, press to ATO. I was just starting to feel comfortable after the uh, uh, press to ATO, ATO call, and I have a lot of switches overhead that I need to see if I can reach and see under higher G conditions, and I was just starting to conduct a little evaluation, looking up at the overhead panels and reaching, and then uh, the uh, incident happened. And I feel a decrease in the acceleration. My eyes went immediately to the engine uh, instrumentation, and I saw that we'd lost the center engine. Of course, the master alarm came on, and the, uh, then you fall back on your training. We've had lost many engines and simulators, and so now you just do the switch throws and the things that you've always trained to do. Be copy, stand by. Flight photo abort ATO. Abort ATO. Challenger Houston, abort ATO. Abort to orbit was the call. Continue to press uphill. But seconds later, a sensor indicated a second engine overheating. Normally, the engine would automatically shut down, lest it explode. Only one engine would never get the shuttle into orbit, and it would have to attempt an emergency landing at night, somewhere in Africa or the Mediterranean. But was the sensor faulty? Flight controller Jenny Howard had seconds to decide. Her call was, inhibit the limits, override the sensor. Unknown to us, on the ground, they saw an engine sensor fail in one of the remaining engines. 
And uh, Jenny Howard, who was making that call that day, uh, recognized that it was definitely a sensor failure and recognized the danger to us if we lost that engine in that mode and very courageously and correctly made the call to the flight director to have us inhibit those limits. Attempted to go inhibit it. Uh, I know we're single engine capability. Are we past town, madam? Yes, we are, flight. Limits to inhibit. Challenger Houston, main engine limits to inhibit. Now, this was obviously called to prevent us okay. from losing another engine. We'll keep a good close eye on it. Okay, which deuces are you having trouble with? It's the fuel turbine tent. That's what shut down the center. We've lost another one on the right engine. Looking good. Now this call has never been made before and is rarely exercised in simulations. So it was obvious to us that there were some things going on with the other engines it was not good. And uh, I will always be in her debt for doing that, as will the rest of the crew. All of us, I think, could have flown, breathed a sigh of relief once we reached main engine cutoff. Because now, from then on, in our minds, it's downhill. It's a piece of cake. given the opportunity to carry some music on board, tapes to play in, the, in a pocket uh, stereo player. There's a song called The Southern Cross by, uh, I believe it's Crosby, Stills, Nash and & Young. And I remember one point looking out the window at the Southern Cross and playing that music. When you see the Southern Cross for the first time You understand now why you came this way you could spend days just looking out the window and, and taking it all in and, and learning what the different continents look like. But it's as big as the promise, the promise of a coming day. So I used to have the little dreams when I was a kid that I'd go running down the street and jump up in the air and go flying and just fly through the air all by myself. And that's what weightlessness is like. We've been uh, having a lot of fun up here. Uh, and of course, uh, doing a lot of uh, good work for the space program. The first day or so when you're adjusting to it, you uh, flail around a lot. You, know, you reach for a switch and your feet swing around and hit the ceiling. You know, zero-g, it just in itself, it, it causes, causes you to, to find games. I would, I would be up on a flight deck working like a good pilot, right? And I would hear these guys laughing and roaring downstairs, and I'd uh, say, well, I wonder what's going on. Well, I finally went down, and there they were doing this, uh, this precision drill team stuff, and it was fantastic. We were constantly asking the question, where's Joe? And lo and behold, what should we find? But, but look at this. We have discovered either an alien space creature or, no, no, it is. It is Dr. Allen. Large, large in personality but diminutive in stature, he's managed to insert himself in yet another crevice. Somebody find will come along and make me forget about loving. In zero gravity, the ultimate experience is the spacewalk. Before Challenger, it was easy to ignore the peril to an astronaut like Joe Allen. We saw only the romance in it. Putting on a spacesuit always reminded me of the activity that a four-year-old youngster is put through when his mother or father dresses that youngster in a very heavy snowsuit. Your mother doesn't bundle you up, but your shipmates do. Uh, put you in the spacesuits, and uh, uh, oftentimes with a pat on the head uh, and a butter cookie for good luck, which they feed you, they then put the helmet on the top, snap it into place, and from that moment on, you float in the suit. You don't stand on the boots. Uh, from time to time, your toes will touch the boots or your head will bob up against the helmet. But basically, you are floating 
in this cocoon, so to speak. You float out through the hatch. You're now then provided with what is literally a three-dimensional magic carpet. And you can, using the controls, maneuver yourself away from the mother ship. You are orbiting the Earth as surely as the moon orbits the Earth, and you are yourself a satellite. There was always the danger that a faulty jet in the backpack would spin the spacewalker uncontrollably into the void of space. It all came to seem so routine, but it never was. Launching commercial satellites from the shuttle was meant to defray the cost of operation. After the Challenger accident, President Reagan has decided that the deployment of commercial satellites is no longer worth the risk. They're orbiting bombs when we, uh, when we carry them up in the payload bay. Um, they have volatile fuels, they have electrical power systems, but they're designed to have all kinds of safety features within them. You're working in an area that has a potential for some type of explosion. Five times in the first 24 flights, the shuttle executed a rendezvous with broken satellites in orbit. I had always thought that rendezvous was a delicate but straightforward dance between the orbiter, the satellite, and the computer. But commanders knew that the hydrazine fuel in the satellites made them giant firecrackers. The problem is the hydrazine is a very deadly uh, substance. Uh, you know, it, in its gaseous form or its liquid form, that it can, and when it turns to gas, it can kill you. So we were concerned more about somehow or another the EVA crew members being exposed to the hydrazine that would have caused them a, a health problem. If the EVA astronauts, the spacewalkers, were contaminated with gaseous hydrazine, they could poison the whole crew. If they got it on the suit and then had to come back into the space shuttle, we had to deal with the uh, hydrazine that might be on our spacesuit because a spacesuit, eventually, that air comes back into the shuttle. Discovery. The achievement of this crew in November 1984 put them on the cover of Time magazine. Commanded by Rick Houck and piloted by Dave Walker, the mission recaptured two malfunctioning satellites, replaced them in the hold, and returned them to Earth. Discovery, Houston. Go ahead. We'd like you to give us... Bringing the satellites back into the payload bay was full of uncertainty. CRT-1. Well, the satellites had been in orbit for several months. On board, they had some fuel, hydrazine. There was the potential that a freeze-thaw cycle could have ruptured some piping with this hyd hydrazine in it. If this had occurred and we brought the satellites back to Earth, there was a potential for spilling some of that hydrazine inside the payload bay of the shuttle on re-entry. Well, there could have been a fire in the payload bay. After ascent, re-entry and landing are the most dangerous time of spaceflight. After closing payload doors, small jets are fired to slow the orbiter down. At precisely this time, on his second shuttle flight, Commander John Young heard a loud bang and a sickening thud, which he compared to a sledgehammer hitting the underside of a table. I can't tell you how nervous I was. <laughs> it was really, a, it was really a pretty grim time. We'd been running on this one computer that failed a whole mission uh, for 10 days, and it worked like a champ, and then all of a sudden it quit. And, and so here we bring this other computer up, uh, go a little further along and, and fire its thruster, and it quits and we were starting to uh, roll in y'all very rapidly. Uh, what you think about is getting some uh, control on a vehicle uh, so, that, uh, so that you don't uh, build up in too rapid uh, acceleration. Well, well free, this is free drift now we're talking about. What yeah, are the dangers of extended free drift? Extended free drift with a, with a thruster going, uh, effectively a small thruster going on you would spin you up as fast as you, till the vehicle came apart if you stayed there long enough. Spin you up into outer space? Oh, well, just around, around, around. I see. Yeah. Traveling 65 miles high and 24 times the speed of sound, the craft slows down with a series of roll reversals. 
it really begins uh, a half an earth away from where it ends. In other words, if we're going to land in California, we start re-entry someplace over the Indian Ocean. We start it by burning an engine. You feel yourself begin once again to weigh a few ounces. And the instruments in the ship that record the G levels begin to quiver ever so slightly. As the spacecraft enters the Earth's heavier atmosphere, it encounters unimaginable temperatures. The actual shock wave off the nose sticks out that far in front of the nose, and then it's about four or five inches wide. And outside of that is 4,000 degrees. It's pitch black outside, but little by little, you notice that there's a, a faint glow. Uh, light being inside a neon tube. A curious pulsing flame as the plasma sheath envelops the orbiter, creates a mesmerizing dancing core. It is a phenomenon that physicists do not completely understand. And the glow gets brighter and brighter as you get into heavier and heavier atmosphere. And you see it only up or around the windows, of course. And you begin to hear the sound of wind. When landing the shuttle, it's a glider. You don't have an opportunity to take it around as you might with a engined aircraft. So the first time you go into land, you are going to land. Most landings have been on the dry lake bed at Edwards, but the runway at Cape Canaveral was built for the shuttle. The changeable weather in Florida, however, is the shuttle pilot's nightmare. We were the first flight to make a landing at Cape Canaveral, and that was February of 84. We, we very, very nearly found ourselves staring into a fog bank when we got down there. It's coming downhill at around 22,000 feet a minute, and of course we hold that rate of descent right down to 1,700 feet, and there's nothing like seeing the runway for being able to put the thing down on it. And it's amazing how small 15,000 feet of runway looks. When I looked out the window and looked at that great big two and a half mile long runway, looked out the window and thought to myself, that's too small, let's go somewhere else, because we would be completely out of options at that point if the thing really did cover up in fog. That would be very dangerous. And when we actually came down and landed, I'm sure you probably remember all the fog streaming off our wingtips. And any time we moved the elevons, you could see the fog behind the shuttle. We were lucky. I think uh, about an hour after we landed, the fog was a lot worse than it was right when we touched down. So we, get, we had a little bit of luck working our way that particular morning. Of course, the Cape Canaveral runway doesn't have all the margin that we've got out at Edwards where we've got the lake beds and we have several different lake bed runways that we could go to. So whatever the wind happens to be at Cape Canaveral, if you have a crosswind, for example, my wife's flight had a nine knot crosswind when they came down. Uh, and there was some concern that uh, we might have some problems with the orbiter. The only problem that we did have was uh, uh, the commander who was flying the shuttle had to apply brakes on one side a little stronger than the other to keep us going down the center of the runway with a wind coming across the runway. And in doing so, he heated up one braking system on a tire. It locked, the wheel skidded, and when we were close to stopping, uh, we had a tire that blew out. Landing the shuttle is only the last of many risks that are routinely accepted by those who fly what is still an experimental rocket plane. Thousands of professionals stand behind the astronauts, but it is the astronauts who put their lives to the test. We enjoyed an extraordinary string of successes. But in the world of flying machines, 24 test flights is a very small number. It ended on January 28th, 1986. Going up and coming down never be routine for me, and I don't think it will be for anybody else. If you're careful, maybe it wouldn't be risky. You've got to be very careful all the time because there are situations you can get into that if you're not real careful, you can't get out of. And you want to make sure that never happens to you. You sort of realize that you have taken uh, a major risk with your life after about a week in space, you begin 
to miss all the good things that you have on the ground and and fresh air and children and things like that uh, are particularly exciting to uh, get back to. They cultivated an air of invulnerability because they had to. In their talk, they downplayed the risky side of their risky business. He's all right. In an ironic way, it made them seem less human. <laughs> now, after Challenger, they are very human indeed. I was nervous about this last afternoon together and thinking we should take walks on the beach holding hands and speaking profound things and he spent the afternoon body surfing and I decided he obviously wasn't worried and so uh, there was really little reason for me to spend a great deal of time worrying if he was he was perfectly content with where he was and what he was about to do. I never did get used to the fact that Joe was in this high-risk business. It seemed strange to me that once Joe was assigned to a flight, that for two years we would prepare for that day, not knowing that something might happen or that he would come back from it with joy. And that to me was a rather bizarre turn of events because any, any of us know that our husbands can go to work in a car and possibly have an automobile accident and not come home that day. But you never prepare for that day. It just happens and then you take it from there. I certainly knew that something was going to happen. And I don't think that that's outside the realm of possibility in the future. I mean, you can't fly X number of missions without something going wrong somewhere along the line. It's three hours in holding. Here we see the uh, 51L crew enjoying breakfast. I think typical of every pilot who flies, they always believe that uh, they'll never be involved in the accident, and if they do, through some miracle, they're going to survive, but they don't dwell on it. I think every individual who flies uh, recognizes the risks involved in flight, and they accept those risks. Big smiles today, confidently getting into the van. As they walked out to the pad, they were cheerful, they were exuberant, they were ready to go, they were well prepared. Uh, they had the exhilaration of liftoff, uh, the initial powered flight, and that's how I remember this crew. We have main engine start, four, three, two, one, and liftoff, liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle. Liftoff confirmed. Liftoff. Here's the Challenger roll program. Roger, roll, Challenger. Good roll, flight. Roger, good roll. Velocity 2,257 feet per second. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles. Downrange distance 3 nautical miles. Challenger, go with throttle up. Challenger, go with throttle up. Fight out trajectory. Okay, everybody, stay off the telephones. Make sure you maintain all your data. Start pulling it together. Flight JC, we've had uh, negative contact. Lost the landing. Flight Fido, go ahead. RSL reports vehicle exploded. Copy. Don't reconfigure your console. Take hard copies of all your displays. Make sure you protect any data source you have. One year later, they are still trying to come to terms with the tragedy. But they will move on. The next flight is February 1988. Two weeks ago, NASA announced the crew for that first flight. Navy Captain Rick Houck will be the commander. Air Force Colonel Dick Covey will be the pilot. All of the five-man crew are veterans of past shuttle flights.
as it sat on the launch pad at Cape Canaveral. A wreath hangs at the Kennedy Space Center, but no special ceremonies took place today. But there will be tributes tomorrow. You heard that testimony uh, that indicated that there were real gaps along the way. Well, certainly uh, when we're dealing with technology or just everyday living, we all make mistakes. And I think uh, perhaps the most important thing is to learn from those mistakes and correct those mistakes. When you and Mike talked about your future together, did he ever say to you something like, what if something happens to me? Well, he always felt, I know years ago he told me he was going to be a test pilot and he was going to be a jet pilot and probably an astronaut. Did I have a problem dealing with that? And I said, no, I don't. I didn't then. And I've found that I just sustained a lot of support from him, even now, even now, and so do my children. Sometimes when we reach for the stars, we fall short. But we must pick ourselves up again and press on, despite the pain. 73 seconds after takeoff, it took with it a crew of seven astronauts. New Center 7's Peter Ford is at Kennedy Space Center near Titusville, where memorial services are being observed. Peter? Peter, good afternoon from the Kennedy Space Center. Today's a time for mourning and re remembrance, but it's also a time for optimism and recovery in the space program. However, this morning at 11.37, silence fell across the Kennedy Space Center, across Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, and across the cities and towns of the Space Coast for 73 seconds. People were remembering this day a year ago and the explosion of the Space Shuttle Challenger and the deaths of our seven astronauts. The accident shocked people around the world. Throughout the nation and around the world, people mourned the deaths of the crew. NASA's Chief of Public Information, Hugh Harris, announced the countdown and the liftoff of Challenger. 73 seconds later, the spaceship exploded. You know, I, I just could not believe what we were seeing. All of us who saw it, you know, knew what had happened. We didn't know how it had happened, but we knew that the vehicle had been lost. Along with the seven astronauts and the $1 billion spaceship, NASA also lost important time in their impossibly busy launch schedule, probably two years out of that program. The resultant cutbacks in the programs cost nearly 2,000 people at NASA, at the space contracting companies, and along the Space Coast their jobs. But they recall the recovery from the Apollo pad fire 20 years ago yesterday. That pad fire killed astronauts Grissom, Chaffee, and White. But their deaths also brought changes in the program, changes that ensure the safety and guarantee the success of the lunar missions, the Apollo program. Today, as they mourn the Challenger deaths and the loss of the spacecraft, people here are also sharing a new optimism that the resumption of the space program and the shuttle launches in February 1988 will also help them recover from the economic slump of the past year. Peter. Thank you, Peter. That's Peter Ford reporting live from the Kennedy Space Center. And cut back drastically. This car lot used to count a quarter of its sales to space workers. We knew we were going to be sort of down due to the fact that these people were leery as to what was going to be the future of the space program or what was going to happen. So we were definitely concerned. We certainly were. In fact, Bob Steele had his best year ever, selling more cars to senior citizens and young people with the cut-in sales to Cape workers. Dealers credit low finance rates and last-minute buying for tax advantage. Most important, the county has diversified. That should help to prevent the space industry from ever controlling economics again. Unemployment a year ago stood at 4.9%. Today, after Challenger, it's just over a point higher. Gross sales countywide over three previous years are unchanged and retail sales are up. And while the value of new construction starts is only about half of last year's, insiders say the county was already overbuilt. The real estate business, we've had a slight slowdown, but we really haven't seen it impact us. Most look to the future for even better times to come. In the short term, with the next shuttle launch plan for 88, callbacks have already begun. With the private sector expected to take over some satellite launches, space industry here will be diversified for the first time, and some predict they'll be blasting rockets out of the Cape, just like in days of old. The disaster also had an impact on a generation of school children, kids who had their eyes on New Hampshire school teacher Krista McAuliffe. Florida News Network reporter Lauren Baker visited the school and the students one year later. Life goes on at Concord High School without Krista McAuliffe, but not without reminders of her. There are portraits of Krista. There is a memorial, her words etched in stone. But mostly, there are personal memories. I knew Krista as a colleague, and we lost a wonderful teacher, 
an inspirational teacher, and we lost a wonderful person. We lost a wonderful mother. She was also extremely generous with herself and her time. Uh, the stories about her taking kids into her home is not exaggerated. She did do that. From this classroom, Krista McAuliffe taught history and current events. From the shuttle, she hoped to teach the future, to let children know their future could be in space, could be anything they dreamed it to be. She, after all, was going to be the first civilian in space, and she was just a small-town teacher who dared to believe she could do it. If I could fill out an application and get this far, they should be able to try anything and, and feel successful at it. Because of her, so many began to believe in dreams. But 73 seconds after liftoff, the nightmare of reality set in. There was just a feeling of fear over the whole school, and it was just really scary. And then when we found out that there were no survivors, the, it was hard on the whole school. Did the dreams the school teacher hoped to inspire die aboard the shuttle with her? The answer is in the children, who one year ago watched with horror as a fireball erupted in the sky. I think a lot about what she stood for and what she was um, going into space for, you know, to learn more about space and to get children um, excited about it. And every time I think about that, I get excited about space. The shuttle flight would be the culmination and the, and the high point, but not the only part of reaching her dream. Um, she did achieve it and actually did something really important. And, you know, maybe I can do that, too. The students are proof. Challenger may have failed in its mission, but Krista McAuliffe succeeded in hers. There's a proposal before state legislators to create a scholarship fund in the name of astronaut Ronald... The Apollo Lincoln. program had ended, but before the space shuttle program had uh, come along, unemployment back then reached 18% in this area. To give you an idea how tame the recent troubles were economically, uh, unemployment has just crept over 7% uh, in the last year. At any rate, there is certainly much more than economics to this story, and, and there is a great sense of loss, certainly outside the dollars and cents. We are here to cover it at the... Meteorologist Walter Cronus and the Channel 10 Eyewitness News Team. Good afternoon. Michelle is on special assignment today. Jerry Levine is joining us. It was one of the most heart-wrenching sights imaginable. One year ago today, on a cold Florida morning, the space shuttle Challenger blasted off. 73 seconds later, it exploded. The accident brought much of America to tears, and today at the Kennedy Space Center, the seven astronauts who died on that flight are being remembered. Eyewitness News reporter Peggy Lewis is at the Cape with a live report via New Sat 10. Peggy? Jerry Tana, it's been a year of mourning here at the Space Coast. Communities all around the Kennedy Space Center are having tributes and memorial services. This community is very closely tied to the space program. Mostly everyone works for NASA or space-related industries, and it's been a very difficult year. 2,500 people were laid off, but today they pause to remember. At a morning prayer breakfast, and at the Kennedy Space Center, where 13,000 NASA employees spent 73 seconds in silence at 11.38 a.m., the time when Challenger, a year ago today, changed NASA and the space program forever. And in Palm Bay, Florida, at an elementary school named after teacher and Challenger payload specialist, Krista McAuliffe, children lit candles for each of the seven members of the Challenger's crew and talked about why the space program is important and should continue. I think it was kind of sad when they blew up and everything, but I think it's a we need to go to space and build a space station so if something has, happens to our Earth, we'll just go up there and live there. Those people who were in the space shuttle knew the consequences, and they, they just... They, they went up there because they believed in the shuttle, the shuttle program. So after, ha so after having come through a year of mourning and a very difficult year, now people here on the Space Coast are looking to the future. They now say they hope that NASA is able to get its targeted date for the discovery liftoff in February 1988. Tana? Thank you. Eyewitness News reporter Peggy Lewis reporting live from Cape Canaveral. It's been a very difficult year for the families of the Challenger astronauts, but the tragedy has not dampened their support of the space program. Good Morning America's Steve Fox talked with the relatives of five astronauts. There's no denying the fact that you get angry, mm. you know. Uh, that's just part of the, it's just part of the process, I guess. Uh, and you don't excuse, you know. Um, 
errors that might be made or, or negligence. Uh, but it's not a, a sense of severing, you know, your, your bonding with an organization that also gave mm. your spouse a chance to do everything, a chance to do as much as he wanted to do in life. They talk about astronauts having the right stuff, but it seems to many people that the tough job is being the astronaut's family, trying to be ready for the worst. Can you prepare for that kind of a job? We, we all uh, prepare ourselves for a flight. There's some anxiety. There is a feeling of uh, this uh, space shuttle gets off the ground with six and a half million pounds of thrust. That means a thousand times as much thrust as a normal airplane they fly. Surely we should be allowed a thousand times as much anxiety. <laughs> but uh, the idea that, that many of us have is that they are the pioneers for our nation. As there are pioneers in many fields, folding back the new frontier. You have to be big enough to realize the cause that's greater than self. What we have to do as family members is to encourage those people to do what they're good at, what they enjoy doing, and what's good for our country. And uh, if that job happens to have risks involved with it, whether it be an astronaut or a policeman or anything else, then you just accept those risks naturally. Mm -hmm. A lot of people around the country want to know how you are doing. Mm -hmm. If people wonder, are you okay? Mm -hmm. You can say, yeah, we're okay. We're working on it. <laughs> every day, every minute. We're gonna press on. Believe me, Mike Smith would have not given up, nor would have Elle or Judy or Dick or Ron or Greg or Krista. They would have not given up, and we are not going to let them down. That's right. We Today, many of the astronauts' families are in Washington for a private memorial at Arlington National Cemetery. We'll have complete coverage on the shuttle and the space program beginning on Eyewitness News at 5 o'clock. Tana? In the West in Washington. Well, as the country remembers the Challenger tragedy, one small city is feeling the aftermath of the accident in a different way. As Taylor Henry reports, the people of Lampoc, California, are hard-pressed by government cutbacks in the shuttle program. The road signs point to Lompoc, a city of 30,000 in this valley known for its flowers. A year ago, this city was ringing in a new era of the space age, preparing for the nation's first scheduled shuttle launch at nearby Vandenberg Air Force Base. Property values soared up to 10% a year as new homes were built for employees of industry supporting the military shuttle program. The number of hotel rooms was increasing nearly five-fold. Suddenly, Lompoc's high spirits disintegrated with the shuttle Challenger. The plan to launch a shuttle from Vandenberg was pushed back more than five years, and hundreds of former civilian aerospace workers were laid off. Some of them, including John DiMatteo, is still unemployed. It gets tiring looking through the paper, looking for work. According to current plans, if a shuttle is ever launched on the West Coast, it won't be before 1992. That's so far off that the shuttle is no longer top priority here at Vandenberg, where Air Force personnel have shifted their attention to more pressing matters, such as the Titan missile program. Today, there are more than 1,200 hotel rooms in Lompoc Valley, but as few as one in three is occupied. So far, one hotel has gone out of business, and others are barely hanging on. By having this many hotels, it has taken away from business from all of us. Housing starts are down 25%, according to real estate broker Bob McCarthy. Well, it's caused a lot of houses to come on the market. It's caused quite a few vacancies in uh, apartment buildings and so forth. And several hundred more layoffs are expected before the end of the year, as Lompoc attempts to call... All across the nation are remembering the heroic crew of the space shuttle Challenger. It was one year ago today, just 73 seconds into its launch, Challenger exploded, killing all seven crew members. January 28, 1986, the darkest day in U.S. space history. The Challenger exploded at 11.38 a.m., and today, at precisely the same time, NASA workers honored their brave colleagues by observing 73 seconds of silence. To learn the lesson. This afternoon, President Reagan addressed NASA employees from the Oval Office. Under and in other news tonight, Fletcher, cold weather at the Cape last night brought back bad memories of NASA's decision to launch Challenger last year despite the freezing temperatures. ...that won't see another manned space flight for at least another year. 
that still faces major questions about its future. It, it really has undercut and, and called into question why we're in space, how we're going to do it, at what pace. NASA engineers have gone back to the drawing board. Boosters have been redesigned. Other safety features added, including a possible crew ejection system. By and large, I think they followed our recommendations pretty closely. We let some of those human errors and judgments creep into the program, obviously. That has to be corrected. Meanwhile, the shuttle disaster has left the country without a way to launch satellites for national security. New unmanned rockets to pick up the slack are still years away. And when it does fly again, the shuttle will be restricted to government payloads only. The Space Telescope, one of NASA's highest priorities, will be launched in 1988. We had a situation in the last two years where two members of Congress actually went up in the space uh, shuttle themselves. I don't think that was right. I don't think they should have done that. You will not see that happening again. And visions NASA once had of the future, visions of orbiting space stations, Earth-circling aerospace planes, are now in jeopardy framed by a new awareness of the risks of space travel and the costs of failure. In Washington, Tom Walker, Channel 10 Eyewitness News. One man who's very close to the space pro program is Florida Congressman Bill Nelson. Nelson represents the Space Coast on Capitol Hill and was the second civilian to travel in space. His successful trip aboard Columbia ended just 10 days before the disastrous Challenger launch. Congressman Nelson now joins us on Eyewitness News live at 5 from our Washington Bureau. Congressman, just a second ago, we heard one of your colleagues say that uh, never again does he believe congressmen will fly in space. Do you agree? I think the next civilian to fly into space will be Barbara Morgan, who is the backup teacher in space. She will fulfill the legacy that Krista McAuliffe has given to the school kids of this country, and that is it has enthused them in the matters of technology and math and science. That's important to fulfill. I think it's going to be a long time, however, before another member of Congress flies. Uh, uh, right a, a year ago, after the Challenger accident, uh, so many people were saying that, that there is no future for manned space flight at all, that we should do away with manned flight and uh, start using robots in space. Uh, your opinions on that? Well, not a lot of people said that. As a matter of fact, very few did. Uh, and those who did didn't understand. The American space program, you have to have a balance between manned space and unmanned. We have unmanned rockets that can put up unmanned payloads, but we have this unique capability of going into space and returning from space with human beings on board that you can only do with the human in the loop. Congressman, this is Ann Bishop at the Cape. Can you hear me all right? I can, Ann. Uh, Congressman, getting back, if I may, to that question about civilian passengers on board, the people who are running NASA seem to be highly opposed to it. They said it may never happen again. They may never take another civilian. And yet this program in itself belongs to the people. How can they close the door on that? Well, somebody's giving you some wrong information. Uh, that's not what the NASA administrator, Jim Fletcher, has said. What they're, they're talking about is they've got only so much space, and they've got a lot of payloads that they have to get up and they naturally have to have the professional astronauts fly the vehicle and launch the payloads once on orbit. Now the question is, when are you gonna have enough confidence in the system and when are you gonna have the space available that you could take Barbara Morgan, who will be the next teacher in space? Well, Congressman, there's also a delay, I understand, in the uh, possible flight on the 18th or the 19th that they're having to run more tests. Um, do you see this as a serious thing? Are we talking about a light delay, or are we looking at perhaps even another year, too? Well, we hope and pray it's not going to be a major delay, because if it is, uh, we're in a heap of trouble. I mean, we need to get payloads up. Uh, but I don't think that there is the threat of a serious delay at this point. I think it'll launch in early 1988, and when it launches, it will be as relatively safe as possible, realizing that space flight is risky business. Congressman, we hope you're correct in that. We thank you for joining us live at 5 on Eyewitness News. Well, he was the first American to orbit the Earth, and tonight in Washington, Senator John Glenn criticized President Reagan for failing to mention the Challenger crew in his State of the Union message last night. A year ago, President Reagan's State of the Union address was... Judy Resnick, mission specialist and a NASA veteran with 150 hours logged in spaceflight. Ronald McNair a native of Lake City, South Carolina, also a mission specialist. Ellison Onizuka, an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel and part of the Shuttle Defense Department mission. Gregory Jarvis was on the roster. 
as a payload specialist working on the advanced communication satellites. And then there was one of our own, Krista McAuliffe, a wife and a mother, Krista was one of us, the first ordinary citizen to go into space. Krista was the girl next door, the teacher we all wished we could have had. That is the uh, search area off Cape Canaveral, out in the Atlantic you're looking at. A year ago today, students all over the country watched the Challenger explode and watched NASA try to pick up the pieces. Stephen Solomon and Celia Noodleman saw the shuttle explode on TV that day. I can imagine what the kids felt. They were probably crying their hearts out, being so sad. I mean, I was very startled. I got a little tear in my eye because it's like not right that this should happen. Steve and Sela were at Ojis Elementary School then. They're here at Holland Oaks Junior High School now in the seventh grade. They may have changed schools, but not their feelings about Krista McAuliffe or the Challenger tragedy. It's an accident that happened. You can't stop that, but you got, they have to still keep going on. I, feel, I still feel sorry for everybody, but... I am still very sad that it happened. I mean, it was a real big shock to me. But like Seal said, like, we have to go on. We just can't let one thing stop us from doing everything else. Is that a consonant or a vowel? A consonant. consonant. Good. What about this? Marsha Murphy Triangle. has a personal reason right. for remembering the Challenger tragedy. A kindergarten teacher at Lauderdale Manors Elementary, Murphy is also Krista McAuliffe's second cousin. I think in the beginning, um, there was that complete feeling of just devastation, like everything stopped, everything came to a standstill, and a terrible feeling of, of sadness and terrible feeling of loss, and then, which of course I think still exists, but then I think there was, after things started to be made known and come out through the media, through the investigations, I think then there also was a feeling of anger. I think the entire mission was lost. Krista didn't accomplish anything as far as the, what she was to do for education. In, um, in one sense, of course, she did because her legacy continues right now in the schools with the children. She would be proud to know that, well, her life wasn't, wasn't lost in vain. A year later, how do others feel about the tragedy? Most agree that the space shuttle program must carry on. I think it was really tragic, and the news that's come out about it, that it might not have been necessary, it could have been avoidable, I think is, is really a crime. But I do think the program has to go on. You've got to go forward. You can't go backward. I think it's taught us a good lesson. Three, two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the... The future tower. doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. The Challenger crew was pulling us into the future, and we'll continue to follow them. Complete to be uh, feasible for the next shuttle mission? Well, we're looking at several proposals, and uh, so far we really have not settled upon the one that uh, we probably will use. So we're going to have to go through several iterations before we find the right system. What's the future now for the shuttle program? Well, the future's great. I think the, uh, the payloads are definitely backing up. We're going to have plenty of business, and our problem is to get everything retested and get it back online in a safe, certified manner so that we can get on with the program. Jim, the shuttle was originally designed to serve as a space station, among other things. What's uh, going to happen now with the space station now that it's been set back by this? Well, I feel we're going to go and incorporate some of the safety measures that we used on the orbiter back in the space station, so it will be a plus for the space station. Jim, thanks for joining us. Uh, she did do that. She was going to be the first civilian in space. She was just a small-town teacher who dared to believe she could do it. If I could fill out an application and get this far, they should be able to try anything and, and feel successful at it. Did the dreams the school teacher hoped to inspire die on board the space shuttle with her? Well, the answer's in the children who a year ago watched with horror when the fireball erupted into the sky. I think a lot about what she stood for and what she was um, going into space for, you know, to learn more about space and to get children um, excited about it. And every time I think about that, I get excited about space. The shuttle flight would be the culmination and the, and the high point, but not the only part of reaching her dream. Um, she did achieve it and actually did something really important. And, you know, maybe I can do that, too. Her inspiration does live on. 
many of us are still following Krista's dream, her belief that each of us can accomplish whatever that we're determined that we want to accomplish. We're going to have more from the Cape coming up on Eyewitness News at 5.30 and 6. John? Thank you, Ann. And that does it for us. Michelle Gillen and Art Carlson are up next for Eyewitness News at 5.30. I'm Linda Patillo with Challenger Remembered, with reports from Cape Canaveral, the Marshall Space Center, and from across Florida. To search for reasons why Courage as they chased our dream To the heavens through the sky They gently kissed the face of God With no time to say goodbye Good evening, I'm Barry Judge. And I'm Jim Sackett. This is a special edition of Action 5 News. One year ago today, the space shuttle Challenger exploded, killing the seven astronauts aboard. Tonight, we will take you to the Kennedy Space Center as people there pause for a moment of silence today in remembrance. Plus an interview with astronauts about the future of America's space program. But first tonight, families of the Challenger astronauts gathered today for a solemn tribute outside Washington, D.C. Family members traveled to the